Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm greeting you from Los Angeles, California, where it is in the evening here. Greetings to you from across the Pacific. And I'd like to thank Supava for inviting me to come and speak with you tonight, and especially congratulations to your 25th silver anniversary. I have great respect, always have had great respect for your members and your organization. I'm very honored you've invited me to be with you here this morning, tonight. I also want to thank the conference host, the Vietnam Film Institute, for graciously turning this conference into a virtual one so we can still be together while we're still, unfortunately, physically apart. So I have a presentation. I'm going to share my screen. And let me see here. Okay, so we have that. Now, while my topic is very serious and people could think it's very depressing, I'm very thrilled though that the conference theme is Avery Cloud has a silver lining because even though this topic is serious on climate change and how our archives intersect with it, uh, in keeping with the theme of the conference, I also hope to provide some positive, actionable ideas on how archives can mitigate their impact on the environment. So strangely, this pandemic period, which we have not yet completed, we are still going through it, but it brought the world together through this shared trauma that we've all experienced. We found ways to continue connecting. We need to connect, we're humans. We want to connect with each other and communicate even while we were forced to be apart over this time. We use digital technologies to continue these connections. And I love thinking about these digital technologies and we're you know, zooming around the world right now. And to me, it looks like these magnetic threads that are in our galaxy. I love this image here from the x-rays um, um, showing the center of our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. And I learned today that in Vietnamese, the term actually is silver river, which I love the word silver since that is one of the themes of the conference and river having that feeling of continuity. I, I like that better than Milky Way. A way how we've also, here's a nice illustration of how we have used technologies to stay connected. So this is a work that took place over the last 24 hours by the artist Yoko Ono, whom some of you might be familiar with. And it's called Sky, to see the sky. And basically it was 60 cameras set up at various arts organizations around the world, just had their cameras pointed at the sky so we could all just pop in now and then, see what was happening in the sky at different points in the, on the planet under the sky that we all share. So you can see the time here was from my time yesterday, 6.30 roughly in the morning, and it's nighttime in Hong Kong in the lower right. You can see how the skies were gray over Liverpool in the UK and it was a nice sky over Poland. Then 12 hours later, it's becoming evening, our time is becoming dawn in Singapore. So the second image down on the left is at the Singapore Art Museum where you can see raindrops on the glass on the window. You can see uh, the sunset in Costa Rica right next door to it. And you can see a plane in the top left flying over Atlanta, Georgia. It was just a wonderful art piece, again, using this technology in a very basic way to show how we are still connected around the world and using these connections to not, the, the technologies, not just to show connections, but also to create art out of it. It was a really wonderful piece. So one benefit of not traveling or commuting during this period has been decreased CO2 or carbon emissions. So we did experience temporary CO2 emission reductions in the last year. So by April of last year, uh, after we had all been in full shutdown around the world for a month, the global CO2 emissions decreased 17%. And just under half of that was from decreased surface transport. We just stopped driving. Some countries for a while had decreased in 26%. Now, even though that was all very positive and high at the time, overall, over the course of the year, it's averaged out to be 7% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. That's the GHG. But even though we decreased last year and everything else is all starting to get back to, uh, you know, the economies are all starting to boom again, it is increasing, but it is still increasing even with the reductions. And that's because these greenhouse gas emissions stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years. 
So think about it like filling up water in a bathtub. So you have a bathtub and you have water coming out of the spigot to fill the water, the water keeps rising. And even if you trickle down, you have that just be dripping, 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 instead of a full flow of water, it still eventually will overflow. The bathtub will overflow just because there still is water going into it. That is what is happening with our atmosphere with the CO2, which is why we need to drastically not only reduce, but cut back as much as possible. Now, one of the reasons that it, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions rate were raised in the last year was because of methane gas emissions that increased more. And I'll get into that in a little bit. It also didn't help that we had to Zoom. Here I was saying like how, and I'm not making this to be a commercial for Zoom, but you know that's just you know, what we're using right now. We Zoomed, we binge watched television, you know, because we couldn't go out. And so we raised emissions as well, just because of just our life now in, in digital form. <laughs> and we had to rely on these digital technologies. We just had to, but as a result, though, it also had a demand on the devices that eventually will become e-waste as those devices that we had to purchase or that we used become e-waste after they're no longer in use. So we live in the Anthropocene right now, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. It is the Anthropocene epoch. We humans are the reason why we are living in this environment currently. Now, the global consensus is that we need to, if, if we have an increase of two degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100, it's going to result in extremely dangerous climate change, and we're already on, well on the way to that point. Of course, we have a warmer ocean, which means dead sea life and no food. The melting ice, as a result of that, we have flooded coastal areas, which I know many of you are familiar with. The methane gas, which I was mentioning before, that is 28 times, it releases 28 times more greenhouse gas emissions than fossil fuels and CO, into the CO2. And that is happening because not only because of agriculture, because of the melting ice, the warmer climate, the permafrost is melting and that is releasing methane gas and also ancient bacteria. So scientists are wondering here, we just went through COVID, what possibly could be released that has been buried for thousands of years under the permafrost. We have severe weather, cyclones, hurricanes becoming stronger. We have drought, we have less potable water, less food. We have starvation, suffocation, we have human migration, so we already have climate refugees, and this will result in wars because people will be fighting and having wars over precious resources. So we need to decrease the greenhouse gases, we need to keep the temperature lower. We should not let it rise actually more than 1.5 degrees centigrade or 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit from the pre-industrial era. Now, unfortunately, we've already raised it almost a degree centigrade. To achieve the goal, though, to not let it get higher than that, we need to decrease by 2030. We need to decrease by 7.6% annually. Now, I mentioned before that last year, because of COVID, it was at 7%. We need to keep that and do it better, but we've already raised to be even pretty much what we were before COVID. If things are kept as they are now, the global temperature will rise three degrees centigrade by 2100. And actually what we have right now, the atmospheric burden of CO2 that's in the atmosphere now is 412.5 parts per million. Now this is the same, it's comparable to where it was during the mid Pliocene warm period of 3.6 million years ago. Now during that time, the sea level was 78 feet or 23 meters higher than it was today. The average temperature was seven degrees Fahrenheit higher than in pre-industrial times. We are already, what is it? We are already, um, Two point, we're already higher than, uh, we're getting close to it. We're like two degrees higher right now. Um, at that time, there were large forests in areas of the Arctic that are now under tundra. So just to give you a sense. So in the mid Pliocene warm period, camels were roaming in what is now Nunavut, Canada. So up there close to Greenland. And in case you're thinking, oh, this could never happen again. Well, last week, President Biden and Vladimir Putin were talking about how they're going to be navigating the new, sea uh, the new uh, shipping channels that are being created or developed in the Arctic now that the ice is melting. So ships will be able to go across that. There will be new shipping channels up there in the Northern area. So we had temporary reductions. 
because of COVID, but will these reductions stick? And it really is money is the driver, it's supply and demand. So there were two other periods where there was less demand on uh, where CO2 um, uh, emissions were reduced. That's when we had the oil crisis in 1979 to 1980. And then we had the recession, the global recession, 2008, 2010. And so because of the less demand for oil, for fossil fuels, there was then more money, more investments put into renewable energy development. So what we need to show the world is where we do not need fossil fuels any longer. So it's already, there is already a trend to by investment firms to not invest in coal plants and to invest instead in renewable energy. So we need to encourage this and keep it going. So where do we intersect with all of this? Well, archives intersect through ICT, so information technology. And we do this through energy consumption and hardware use that are required to keep our digital files, our digital files that are in our archives alive. So thinking about how this worked in 2019, we're going to global fossil uh, emissions. So the big driver is power, that's the electricity. So if the electricity is generated by coal, then of course that is going to have more CO2 emissions. So you can, you, in the red is where our archives are intersecting with ICT. So we have electricity that you're using on premise, or if you're even if you're using cloud storage, yes, it's somebody else's storage, but it is your data on it. So you're not absolved of responsibility. Industry, the manufacturers who create the hardware that we are using to do our, uh, to produce and conserve and preserve our digital content, the servers, the computers, all those devices. We use surface transport, the cars, buses, trains for getting to work, for shipping goods. We have public buildings and commerce, that is your archives building is emitting CO2. And residential, you live somewhere, so you yourself are emitting CO2. And then there's aviation, which emits CO2. And that is because of travel, obviously, or shipping by plane. So more precisely, how the percentage of ICT emissions and how we all intersect with it is where right now, watching this session, you're using a computer. You're using some kind of device. That's an end user device. And so it is estimated to be like end user devices, the emissions will decrease just because the devices are getting, uh, becoming more efficient in how they're being you know, manufactured. Then we have the telecommunic telecommunication networks. That is whoever is your internet service provider that you're using to connect to the internet. And then the data centers, which where the Zoom, the Facebook, the YouTube, wherever it is that you are then watching this. All of those though, the data centers, the telecommunication networks, those emissions are going to increase even with efficiencies in cooling, just there is just so much data that is being used and produced. So let's do a comparison between the air travel, which we were talking about how some of the emissions went down, the CO2 levels went down because we weren't traveling as much, and Zoom. So if Sipava had been held in person as it had been originally planned in Da Nang, so what would be my CO2 emissions if I flew from LAX to Vietnam? So there, I used a carbon offset calculator between LAX and the airport in Singapore, because that's the closest airport in the calculator to Da Nang. And I myself would have then emitted or been responsible for emitting uh, 1,237 kilograms of CO2. Now we are using Zoom. Let's say there is 100 people who are watching this right now, participating in it, and using this calculator that's on this link. 100 participants for one hour is just under a kilogram of CO2. So that's quite a big difference. That's basically like driving three miles in a gas engine car. Now that doesn't include the CO2 from data centers, different power suppliers around the globe, but still it's obviously much less than if, if even I myself had just traveled to Da Nang from LA. So Sipava members, you all intimately understand the dangers that climate change present to your collections. You've all pretty much, I'm sure, experienced it. You have heat and humidity that contribute to your collections deterioration. So this is how climate change is impacting you. The rising sea levels cause flooding during storms and basically it will overcome land over time as the, rising, as the sea levels rise. So your physical collections are at risk, just not only from the natural deterioration of them and end of life, especially with magnetic audio and videotape, climate change is placing all of your collections at risk. So as a result, archives are increasingly digitizing their collections for both preservation and access. 
you know, you're also receiving born digital content to store and preserve as well. So you're starting to get this wave of digital content that you need to store and manage and take care of. So using digital technologies, it implicates the archives in contributing to climate change, not just that climate change is impacting you. There is a circular relationship. The environment impacts you, but then you, the archives, impact the environment in turn. So there is a relationship going on. Every action by individuals, by organizations, by archives, they impact the environment. They intersect through, again, the greenhouse gas emissions by energy use, but also we have direct toxic endangerment to people. And also because of the hardware that we are using, also we have the legacy video, audio, film, and data storage that then will become e-waste eventually over time. And we're depleting natural resources because of all of these devices that we keep purchasing and using. So what can archives do to mitigate their environmental impact? So after I go through a, a bit more discussion, we'll come back to, uh, we can mitigate through preservation actions, through technology choices, and through human choices. So let's first go through about what are some of the parameters here. So archives must digitize, as you're saying, your analog magnetic media, you really have no choice if you have video and audio because those were not meant to last. And so you have to digitize it. Then you must store those digital files on data storage devices. The original analog media will be discarded. So preserving the, all of that content, making it accessible will impact the environment through legacy media destruction, which I already mentioned. And you, will have, you will ultimately destroy those because there will be nothing on them worth keeping. You have the electricity use that you are using to preserve that data, to make it accessible through the storage, through the management, and you are going to be using energy resources that can be dirty or clean. Then you have hardware and media destruction, which because it, uh, digital storage just devices are just never meant to last a long time. They have a finite shelf life as well. So uh, eventually what will happen to those, will they will be recycled or incinerated or dumped in a landfill. Because data storage devices do not last forever. They are material goods, they're material things. When their useful life is over, they're disposed of in one way or another, they don't last forever. Electronics products lifespans. There are two service lives. One or is the initial, when it's brand new, the original owner use, and that can last two to eight years. The manufacturers build an end of life as new models are released, and the new models obviously would have either more storage on them or they're more efficient. There's a reason they do it, not just to keep us all beholden to them. Then there's the second service life. So after the initial service life, then the original owner can then either give it, they can refurbish it, they can give it to somebody else to refurbish and then we sell that. And that can go on for five to 20 years. But then eventually at the end of the second service life, the end of life options will be to e-waste. At that point, then you have a choice, go to a landfill, which hopefully not, incinerate it, recycle it, hopefully yes, or export it, which you don't quite know what's going to happen to it and usually it's not good. E-waste can contain heavy and rare earth metals and plastic. So as you're thinking about how are you going to be storing the, your data on what devices, consider the recycling potential of your storage media and devices. So we all have responsibility to really be thoughtful about how we do this because we are depleting the planet of its natural resources. There are only so many finite resources that we use to create our electronic devices. They use heavy and rare earth metals. Rare earth means it's rare. You can't regenerate, you can't recreate it. And heavy obviously means it could be toxic. The rare earth metals, which are used in everything, unfortunately only less than 1% of these rare earth metals or elements are currently recycled because it is really difficult, can be difficult to reclaim these materials out of the devices once they're put in. And the heavy metals themselves are toxic by nature, which means if they are just dumped into a landfill, then those toxins go into the soil and can go into the groundwater. Other natural resources are silica sand that is used to make electronics and glass. That is also a finite natural resource. Now you can go to the beach and you might think, wait a minute, there's a lot of sand. The desert has sand. No, silica sand is a particular type of sand. It has to be pure it has, it, in order to be used for electronics and glass. It can't just be any kind of sand and there's actually a shortage of silica sand. Helium is also used to make hard drives, 
spin cooler use less energy. That's all good because you want them to be cool. You want them to use less energy, but helium is also a finite resource as well. And then we have purified water. And with the drought that is happening around the world, this has actually caused a crisis in uh, the manufacture of microchips and in semiconductors that are used in many devices, cars and electronics, or well, the, the electronics in the cars, but also the computers. Other things. So the purified water shortage has also been making a shortage of electronics. So, then, so let's talk about plastic. So plastic, we all know how we can recycle plastic because we have an established you know, method in the industry. We recycle our bottles, we recycle you know, everything that we can, but the plastics that are used in computers and servers and phones, those are different formulations. And so it's not as easy to recycle them, uh, those plastics. They have to be definitely separated out into the different types of formulations for recycling. So let's talk now about the different types of data storage, more specifically, now that you know a little bit about how they can have rare and heavy earth metals in them and plastic. So the three types of data storage options, we're talking about physical data storage media. You have spinning disk, which is hard drives. You have data tape, like LTO tape, and you have NAND or solid state uh, storage or flash storage. Now the cloud is just a methodology. The cloud is basically sitting on top of a mix of these three different storage carriers. And we'll, I'll go into cloud storage um, at the end of all of this. So first spinning disk. Okay, so spinning disk, the hard drives, those can be either just a single hard drive you have on top of your desk, or it can, they can be included within a server. The electricity use on these, the spinning disk is very high. They have internal fans. They need power to operate and process. They can't just sit there and use them uh, and just and use it. They have to be powered on. The environment has to be maintained at a constant temperature and cooler. And again, I mentioned before that helium film drives reduce energy use actually by 23%. But again, helium is a finite natural resource. The life expectancy, the drives and parts usually can be replaced every three to five years for an initial service life. And it does have potential recyclable parts, um, the plastics, the rare earth metals, the magnetic material, that's very important, and it has heavy metals. Now, how can you get that out? Let's talk about that for a second. So there are three hard drive manufacturers, um, and this is just the market share from the first quarter of the year, Seagate, Western Digital, and Toshiba. And then I have the stat there that 288 exabytes of hard drive storage was shipped in the first quarter of this year. So when people talk about how much data is there in the world, how much have you created that we're storing, what you want to look at is see like, hmm, how much storage has been shipped out by manufacturers. And so this is only hard drive storage. There are different statistics for uh, NAND, for solid state, and also for LTO. So just 288 exabytes in one quarter storage was shipped out. So recycling these disks, the manufacturers, they would love to recycle this media because they understand very well that the resources that are put into these hard drives are finite. They need to figure out how to recycle them. They want to you to recycle it. Um, originally though, they'll say like, well, it's hard to do it because they call it, one of the manufacturers I spoke to called it death by screws because it's difficult to have to unscrew all the parts of a hard drive and then to go through and reclaim the magnetic material and other materials. So they say, well, it costs too much to do that. And so they just shred it. But there are some promising recent efforts, you know, in just in the last few years, because again, they are realizing, these manufacturers are realizing they need to figure out how to recycle it because it is getting harder and harder to get these metals and the material that they need. So Dell, Seagate, Teleplan, they developed a method to scrape rare earth metals off and, off the, and, uh, and the magnets from hard drives they're recycling them to go into new devices. So Dell laptops, are, many of them are using uh, reborn magnets that have been recycled from other devices. Uh, Dell, again, they have an international program actually. So here's a website and I think this is being recorded. So hopefully you can go back and you can um, catch these um, URLs. But anyway, Dell Technologies, you can go online and you can find out in your region, in your country, where you can go to, uh, basically turn or give them your um, electronics so that they can recycle it. And it's not just consumer electronics, it's business. Hewlett Packard HP also has a global consumer and business recycling program. And here in this image, there's a drop down there. I just selected Singapore. So you can go to that website. You can go and see your region, see your country and how can you 
give them your um, older electronics for them to be able to recycle. In the US only, unfortunately, um, Western Digital has a recycling program geared towards consumers. So it's only five drives at one time, but they will accept drives from any manufacturer. Why are they doing that? Because they know they need to get those magnetic materials. They need those, those rare and heavy earth metals you know, out of those devices. So they're offering this program. And Singapore, actually, their National Environment Agency, they have published this e-waste recycling effort. I was very impressed by it that they have this out there. They're very forward thinking in how they are promoting their e-waste recycling programs and their um, environmental programs. So moving on to solid state drives, to NAND or flash memory. So a different kind of medium. Uh, no moving, it's not like uh, hard drives, which have spinning disk. Nothing spins on this. There are no moving parts. So you can power it down when it's not in use. It runs cooler than a spinning disk. It has a finite number of writes, an infinite number of reads. It has very low, low to medium electricity use. So this is all really good as far as like an electricity you know, uh, consuming standpoint. It would never be used though for a good archival storage media medium just because the data does fade over time. It isn't as robust in how the data is written to the cells. And it does have some potential recyclable parts in the silicon and the copper. Now, now just here, just this one slide here, not to go too much into cryptocurrency, but um, if you use these a lot, well, I was just saying in the previous slide here about how there is a num limited number of writes that the data can fade. So this is just from a cloud storage provider in France, Scaleway, who basically said, if you are using our data center, our drives, in order to then plot Chia cryptocurrency, then you are responsible, you're destroying our solid state drives and you are responsible for paying for them. And so, um, in fact, it says here that it's destroying most solid state drives in just under a few weeks. So these SSDs and solid state drives are just being destroyed because of the constant use, the constant writing of data to them in just a few weeks. So this, this, um, this is pretty serious. You have to keep that in mind as you're thinking about how do you use your storage media. So we actually have today, like right now, a global storage media and computing supply chain storage, <laughs> supply chain shortage. And this is for a few reasons. One is because of the pandemic, because during the pandemic, there was less demand for these electronics. And now all of a sudden, as the world, the global economy is coming back up, people need, you know, companies need these um, storage devices. But we have a microchip and semiconductor shortage, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of the drought in Taiwan. You know, again, it's climate change. How is the climate, uh, how is the climate change impacting us? How are we impacting the environment? So because Taiwan is pretty, the majority of semiconductors and chips in the world are made in Taiwan. Taiwan is going through a drought, which I'm sure that you know about that. And because there is a water shortage there and because you need this purified water in Taiwan, there is a shortage of chips and drives. And then I already mentioned the shortage of solid state drives from Michia, cryptocurrency use, and also of hard drives. I mean, we're talking about, I tried for my company, just as an aside, to order some hard drives last week. And it was a 13 week wait to get the hard drives that we needed from the order. There's really a backlog. Now let's move on to the third type of data storage media. And so that's data storage tape. And it's mainly LTO these days. You know, that's the largest market share. So the electricity used for LTO data tape is low to medium. I mean, it can be low in the sense of like you write data to tape, you put the tape on the shelf and it's not using any electricity, it's just storing your data on the shelf. The only power it's using is whatever you're using to, in its environment. So it can be used as offline storage, storage in the sense of you write the files to it and it's not stored online, so immediate access. So you only use tapes when needed. The environment must be maintained at constant temperature, but it's higher than regular electronics. The life expectancy is 30 years, so that's better than the other service bikes we're talking about. But in reality, you replace it every two to three generations, which is roughly every five to seven years. The potential recyclable parts to it are plastic. They have screws. Now, the main part of it, though, of course, is the data tape. It's tape. So there's a mylar ribbon. Mylar can be recycled, but it has the... the um, 
the magnetic material that's on it to store the barium ferrite and the metal particles on it, that's what's storing your data. There isn't yet a way to scrape off that magnetic material so that then they can recycle the mylar. So this is further behind than all the other recycling methods and research that's being done for spinning disk and other electronics. So as I mentioned before, the hard drives, there are only three manufacturers. Well, LTO tape, there's only two manufacturers, Fuji and Sony. And there's only one manufacturer of LTO drives, that's IBM. And it's important to keep this in mind because when you have limited manufacturers, that immediately makes digital preservation at risk because you are dependent then on these manufacturers. If IBM ever decided to stop manufacturing uh, LTO drives, we would all be in trouble. So considering spinning disk, even solid state drives, well, let's talk about spinning disk and tape, the total cost of ownership between them, thinking about the cost of the hardware, the cost of the storage, the energy. So the total cost of ownership for disk-based storage or server-based storage is 26 times that of tape-based. The cost of energy for disk-based storage, again, their servers, it uses 105 times more energy than tape-based because again, the tape can just sit. You know, you don't have to have it always running. The floor space for servers means four times the space as a tape. So what oftentimes people will think about, and I'm going to really drill into this in, in a little bit, is you mix, you diversify how your files are stored. So you can have your files that you need immediate access to stored online. You have your files that you, you want to save your preservation files on tape, and that immediately then decreases your energy use, it decreases your costs, and that improves your, actually your organizational sustainability. So now let's move on to the cloud. Now the cloud, of course, is not a device. It's a methodology, as I said before. It just means you're storing your files on other people's servers. So one of the benefits of cloud storage is you're paying for what you use. You don't need to purchase the hardware yourself. So you don't have any organizational storage e-waste. But again, just keep in mind, it is still, you are still contributing to the e-waste for the cloud storage provider. It's just that you don't have to think about it. Using the cloud can be helpful, again, in its economies of scale, because a cloud provider is managing your hardware, your power, your air conditioning, instead of many, many, many individual organizations, you know, spending the same amount of energy individually. Instead, it's all consolidated into one place, where usually the energy and the resources are all maximized or optimized. So again, you don't need to keep buying the hardware, which ultimately you become responsible for, for e-waste. The electricity use is hopefully optimized, but it really depends on the energy, uh, the sources from at the cloud provider. And also the, uh, um, one of the benefits of using cloud storage as I'm sure that most of you have already taken advantage of is where your access can be global. You can provide global access to your collections. So for example, um, I was thrilled to find that the Thai Film Archive has a Google Arts and Culture site. So I could explore here in Los Angeles you know, at least what the, the physical plant looks like, what the physical museum, the archive looks like. Of course, I could not see the films. I couldn't actually see physically the objects, but it gave me a sense of the environment. And so this is one way, another way of providing access to collections, not just to the collections, but also to the home for these collections. So many archives, universities, businesses, individuals, you know, the trend is going into using cloud storage and they're saying, well, that is part of our being carbon neutral. That is a strategy for us to become carbon neutral. But I always say, well, sometimes becoming carbon neutral means you're using someone else's carbon. That carbon is still being emitted. It's just that you can look the other way, you know, but it is still your data. You still are responsible for it. So what I encourage you to do is to be thoughtful and mindful if you're using cloud storage. Just understand your participation in using cloud storage. So number one, consider your vendor's power source, your cloud provider power source dirty, is it coal? Data centers use 3% of the world's electricity. In 2010, there was 1%. There's already estimates that by 2030, it will probably be 7% or more. The six major cloud service providers are moving towards using 100% renewable energy. So this is really great. And they're actually helping, some of them are helping to build wind and solar farms to power not just their own data centers, but also to supply their neighbors back into the community. 
but most of the servers for these organizations are in third-party data centers. They're renting space within existing data centers. Here's a map of data centers around the world. So you can see they're, they're pretty well spread out. Of course, it doesn't show every, every single possible location, but it gives you a good sense of where they're spread out. Going into Singapore, and I don't mean to keep using Singapore as an example. I'm using Singapore because they, there is a lot of information out, um, you know, available online about what Singapore is doing as far as the environment and about where their um, data centers are and what, what they're trying to do with the data centers. So anyway, here is a map of data centers around Singapore. Now, Singapore is a major data center hub for Southeast Asia. There are about 60 data centers within 693 square kilometers, to put that in perspective. Here in Los Angeles, we have a bit more data centers, 73 data centers, but it's within twice as much space, 1,300 kilometers. So there's a lot of data being crunched into Singapore. The energy that these data or that Singapore itself uses is 95% fueled by natural gas, which is imports coming in. So there is an interest in solar for renewable energy. And so there's development of floating solar panel arrays that are being built offshore since there is obviously limited land mass there. So here, for example, so Facebook has built a 100% renewable data center in Singapore. They, uh, paid, they put solar panels on the roof of their data center. They paid to place on other buildings so they could use the solar, uh, solar energy power that was generated from solar panels. Here's an image then of one of the floating uh, solar panel arrays offshore from Singapore. And in fact, Singapore has put a, a temporary pause on building new data centers. So I mentioned that they have a lot already in a small space, which can be a drain on the environment. So they're just thinking about how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to, how, how will this impact the environment? You know, what do we need to do to mitigate this if we're going to have so much data and data centers coming into our, our location? So that's pretty much just giving kind of the lay, the landscape of what you know you could be thinking about as far as uh, storing digital content. We talked about hardware. We talked about maybe using cloud storage, electricity use. Let's talk more specifically then about what digital archives can do to mitigate your environmental impact, your impact on the environment. Get preservation actions, technology choices, human choices. So first, preservation actions. So there's appraisal policies that can be enacted by your archive. Does all digital content that you acquire or that you create, do you need to provide permanent retention? Do they all need permanent retention? If they are retained for a specific period, in other words, not forever, you can move files between tiers of storage, between you know, online storage down to offline storage, and ultimately even delete the files. Does all the content that you acquire or that you create, does it need to be digitized or saved at the highest possible resolution? Which of course we all know, you know, we all know about archives, what the best practice should be, but is it possible that good enough will be fine? Because the main thing is the content. So if you digitize everything at the highest resolution possible, that creates very large files, which means a large amount of storage to manage. So if you want to do that, I would recommend that you store your permanent large preservation masters offline. You don't need to keep them all online, which has the most energy use and requires the most storage. So here's an, uh, an incident that happened in May where the Cape Town University had a disastrous fire, which destroyed 3,500 irreplaceable films. Some from African National Congress, you know, you know, documentation of, of South Africa there. And they were just lost because they were in the part of the library that was destroyed. So they put out a call to researchers around the world to provide digital copies of any research, anything that was copied at the university in the library, even if they were low resolution copies, because they realized that low resolution digital files of content is better than nothing. Because what you want to preserve is not the file. What you want to preserve is the content that is then manifested in that file. So I always say, if you have limited resources and budget, save the content however you can. Don't fetishize the file format or the resolution. Just be sure that the file format that you do use is sustainable, that it's widely supported, that it's widely used, so that you can migrate it into the future. But focus on the content that you need to preserve. 
Preservation actions also, you could perhaps schedule infrequent fixity checks. So fixity checks are if you have a checksum, the, that unique fingerprint of a file, which you want to verify over time to make sure there's no bit loss, that the files are still healthy. Uh, if the files are stored offline on data tape, for example, you don't need to do so many fixity checks. You, they can be infrequent. So it really depends on how the files are stored, on which storage medium, and on which system. If they're stable, you really don't need to do it more than once a year. It really depends on the storage. So yeah, that's this is, becomes part of your policies. Uh, you can use less energy. Now we're going to move from preservation actions to technology. This is related to storage, because obviously if you are using spinning disks for your storage, all those hard drives, servers, that's going to use the most electricity. If you store it on data tape, store it offline, that uses the least energy. So I would recommend that you use hierarchical storage management policies or HSM. What this means is like not everything has to be stored the same way, not everything has to be on spinning disk, not everything has to be on data tape. What you want to do is store large and frequently accessed files offline on data tape perhaps or somewhere else and store only the frequently accessed files online in tier one. So the three tiers, so it's hierarchical storage management, HSM, Tier one is online. That means it's immediate access from spinning disks or solid state drives, if that's what you have. Tier two would be nearline. That means you can store data tape in a, in a storage area network where you have both servers and tape robot, or you can store files on a hard drive for tier two, and tier one is a faster solid state. Tier three is offline storage. That means it's still stored on tape or other media, whether it's solid state or whether it's hard drive, but it's offline, it's not being used. You only go and get that copy when you need it. You just have to wait, you have to be willing to wait for it. So what archives often do is they only have tier one and tier three, and they skip that middle near line. It's just their files are stored online, their, store, their files are stored offline. And if you apply it thoughtfully, you can use cloud storage as part of HSM policies too. So you could have cloud being like very, very, very cold cloud storage as tier three, or you could have more hot storage for tier one. You know, you just have to be thoughtful. Uh, using less energy is, again, you could store on data tape, as I mentioned, LTO, which, and then don't migrate every time a new generation comes out, wait two or even three generations between LTO. Um, when, and then recycle that data tape through destruction. You can't really reuse LTO data tape. You just have to destroy it. Um, and also has a maximum number of reads. Normally you would be shredding it and then incinerating it. You just have to be careful about what the, wherever you're having it um, incinerated, shredded and incinerated, that they're following appropriate policies to cap the incinerator to not have just the, it all go out into the air. If you have a server room on site, running current hardware, you can set the server room temperature to be higher. It can be between 70, 74 degrees Fahrenheit, but no more than 27 degrees centigrade. So it doesn't have to be as chilly as people thought it would have to be in the past. If you're using data tape, it can be an office environment, really. It's very forgiving. And so it, the data tape does not need to be stored in as cold an environment as the spinning disk, the server environment, as long as it's a very more stable uh, temperature and humidity controls. If possible, turn off any unused service, don't have them running if they're not being used, or have them set to go into inactive mode when not in use. If you again have servers on premise, try to consolidate and virtualize several applications on one server. It also results then in fewer servers that you will be replacing or recycling. If you use the cloud, then use it for some applications, but verify the provider's green record, you know, make sure that they are doing their best to try to be energy efficient and try to find out what the power source is. And again, what the green record is for your data center or publication center. For environmental planning, if you can, not everybody can do this, but there are some locations where you can just, you can specify that you want to purchase clean energy where possible, not coal generated. It might cost more, but you know there are some places where you can request that or specify it. Purchase hardware that is energy efficient. Purchase recycled devices. We do that. We'll buy servers that you know the box itself is recycled from other places. It's second life. We'll just have new hard drives that are put into it. 
Um, uh, <laughs> second, the next point, upgrade your servers by upgrading the drives, not the entire box, which is what we do. Recycle by reuse when possible. And if you do recycle data tape and hard drives, try to find vendors that will, who will strip out the parts, recycle the components, go to the websites that I gave you already with, with Dell, with HP, and see about um, if they will take your devices. So that was working on preservation actions, uh, technology choices. Now what about our human extra archival actions? What did we learn from this period that we're living through right now, the pandemic period? Well, one is we can work from home as much as possible, wherever that is possible. Not everybody can do that or impossible do that because that means less transit use, less automobile emissions. If you use transit, use public transit, I, I myself, even in Los Angeles, this car centric city, I try to use the bus, the train. There are subways in Los Angeles <laughs> as much as possible. The less oil, the less gas use, there is less demand, which then tells the investors that go for renewables. That is what the people want. That's what the public want. We don't want gas. We don't want coal. We don't want fossil fuels. They'll get the message. They will follow the money. Hold remote conferences or hybrid events as we are doing right now. So on one hand, we are zoomed out. We want to see each other in 4D. I would love to see you all. On the other hand, though, these remote events, they widen the capability of people to participate who might otherwise not be able to travel to these events. So it then it, it broadens you know, your events, you know, the events where we can share information and meet new people. As hard as it is to meet a new person virtually, you know, we will find ways. And Online events are more environmentally friendly than in person. I mean, I hate to say it, I showed the slide about what would be my carbon you know, footprint, my impact if I flew to the conference versus doing this here. I would rather see you all in person, but it is more environmentally friendly for me to do this presentation from my living room here. So anyway, there are all these different choices that we all can make with our archives, with our personal choices. So I thank you so much. I have a lot of hope in where the world is going, even though sometimes it can find that it um, can be despairing thinking about the climate, but I think that people are pretty much knowing what they need to do and we just need to be thoughtful, you know, and apply what we feel into our work and into our archives. So thank you so much. So thank you. I believe I'm on air, right? I think I am, yes. yes. So thank you, Linda, for starting the 25th Zipava Conference with this much needed reflection and call to action that fittingly encapsulate this year's theme, AV archiving and changing times, successes, failures, and challenges. Uh, situating archives as both a part of and one that is impacted by climate change while also offering means to mitigate this global crisis is Arguably, as you pointed out, one of the greatest challenges the profession must contend with today and as we move forward. So thank you, Linda, for providing us a detailed context and for offering specific action points in response. For our participants on Zoom, you may ask your questions using the Q&A function. For those watching us via the Facebook live stream, you may also post your questions as comments and they will find their way to me as well. I will, then, I will then read these questions for Linda to address. It's currently uh, 10.05 a.m. in Vietnam, and I've been told that we have until 10.20. Um, so while waiting for the questions to come in, uh, I'll ask the first question, if you don't mind, Linda. Yep. So, so, <laughs> so studies time and time again have pointed out of like the geopolitical climate injustice, uh, right? We're in countries that are like measurably least responsible for causing climate change um, are the ones that suffer the most from its effects that you have enumerated. That is that countries with relatively very low carbon footprints are bearing the brunt of carbon dioxide emissions by other countries. Argu arguably, the same relationship can be said between archives in quote-unquote developed countries um, and those in the global south, including most members of Zipaba. Um, I wonder if you can speak of this disparity and the allocation of responsibilities between archives across the globe. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, it is so hard. I, I actually was feeling very guilty even giving this conversation, you know, this talk, you know, being from a country that is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, and also being in one of the wealthy countries where we have the luxury of being able to talk about, oh, what are the different choices? Although there are court archives here as well, you know, who have limited resources, but still, um, it, it's not as dire as it is elsewhere in the world, which is why I try to focus on things that where it's not like, oh, yes, go and, you know, I, when, I, when I try to give the recommendations and, and some ideas, I try to not make them to be expensive ideas. You know, it has to be, we have to make do with what we have, you know, at all archives. Um, if there is any, and I, I feel it would be ostentatious of me to try to tell other archives what to do because they know their best, you know, what, what they're, you know, what they're able to do, what the resources are. Um, other than, I mean, there are options, of course, of being able to share resources, perhaps, you know, in, in the digital archives. I'm sure that this has been a thing that has often come up with SUPAVA and in other conferences, international conferences as well. You know, um, I know it, it is something, it is one of the reasons why I actually, you know, started my company actually is because I wanted to help archives who could not do this kind of work themselves, you know, where they, where they have to, uh, where they have limited resources and staff and infrastructure to do the work. It is hard. I think that, um, I mean, what can I say? I think I'm just rambling here. <laughs> no, I mean, I think you pointed out uh, quite clearly, like uh, at the end of the day, solution, any, any solutions, um, as much as there are discrete solutions that every archive can do, there is a mm -hmm. global call for all of us to collaborate and figure things out. Um, and so you pointed out like a number of things that can be uh, done on a like micro level, both individually and as institutionally. But I think um, to your point, like, these are systemic issues that, that, that needs to be addressed collectively. Um, exactly. Yeah. So there are questions that are coming in. And uh, the first one comes from, uh, I believe this is Mick Newnham, uh, former president of Sapava. This question is, are there economies of scale energy-wise with data centers? What did it, yes, I would, yes, I think that I might've mentioned that a little bit. Uh, you just have to be careful. If you want, if you want to have your, well, by data centers, there's two things. There's one where you can use a cloud storage provider, where basically you're using all of their servers. The other one is where you have your own servers and you're putting them in a data center in a co-location environment, where they're just being hosted there. So then you are not paying for the electricity, you're not you are paying for electricity indirectly by paying for the co-location uh, or the rental space. But basically, the electricity, all of that support, uh, and the air conditioning is being run by the data center, which means then that your archive does not need to host a server and will pay for that air conditioning. You still own that server, but it's hosted in a data center. So that is one way for economies of scale. One is if, if you want to use a cloud provider or um, a, a data center for a co-location center, just do, I would just recommend doing the research to see where are they getting their natural resource, where are they getting their energy resources from? Uh, what is their green record? Are they trying to be efficient, you know, in how they're using energy? Thank you for that. Another technical question um, from an anonymous attendee. So for TCO calculations, uh, which I believe is total cost of ownership uh, between tape and spinning disk, is there an online calculator for this that you can provide? Uh, would you know any online calculator? Yes. If um, Are these slides going to be shared? I believe we can uh, circulate them. Yeah. Or at least the presentation will be recorded and available. Because the, the slide that I had that showed the TCO calculations, that has a link to it from where I got those statistics from. And there are various vendors who are big promoters. Okay. There are promoters who, um, uh, well, they're, they're manufacturers who promote using tape over spinning disk storage. Then, of course, they have calculators that will help you then do that total cost of ownership. So you can just go online and say tape, spinning disk, TCO, and you might be able to find something there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um... While waiting for other questions to come in, uh, you speak about this. Oh, there you go. 
uh, I'm gonna read Ray Edmondson's. Oh, just fitting on the Sipava's 25th anniversary that all of our former presidents are chiming in. So Ray <laughs> Edmondson shares his comment. This is not a question, but a comment. Australia's barrier reef is under threat and about to be classified as endangered by the UNESCO World Heritage Organization. It is uh, sobering to reflect that if the reef is gone in 20 years, let's say, the only record of its aquatic life will reside in audiovisual archives. Mm -hmm. One of the most poignant segments of footage in the National Film and Sound Archive is of the um, thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, which became extinct in the 1930s. Uh, can we think of similar examples? Um, but yeah, this is this, this is an interesting uh, race example. Uh, echoes like what Linda shared from at the beginning on the relationship of how the environment impacts archives and archives impact environment. Um, that perhaps um, as the environment uh, continues to decay or get away from our from from our hands perhaps the only way to preserve the environment is through these recordings as well uh, which then gives even more honest to the importance of actually preserving our our, our records um, yes absolutely I mean the world is um, much of the world is disappearing you know in how it looks today how it looked a hundred years ago it no longer looks like that, not just because of obviously buildings change and people look different, but we're losing the environment around us. And so this documentation, you can have photographs, you can have sketches, but there's nothing like seeing or hearing, you know, something moving, this time-based documentation. Right. And it's same in the in this the same thing um, applies in the inverse, right? It's like if if the cost of preservation is actually our environment then then we have to also reconsider what the cost of oh the 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 impact of what we're preserving because we might be preserving at the cost of actually losing that of which we wish to actually preserve on record mm -hmm. um nabuki yoshiyama uh says that i would appreciate if you could comment on this uh quote unquote contradictory situation as an archive, we have responsibility to preserve and pass our audiovisual materials to future generation at their highest quality. For example, we have an ultra, ultra high definition contents generated every day here at Japan Broadcasting Corporation. What should we do? I believe you uh, mentioned something in passing regarding this. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, um, well, a couple of things. So one is if you are and you want to or you need to have and preserve these files at the highest resolution possible, which means they will be large files. You don't need to store them online, which is going to take up the most storage, which will take the most energy to preserve and store over time. Keep them offline, have access copies, you know, smaller copies, you know, online for the immediate access, immediate use, but the large ones don't need to be using up all that energy. They don't need to expend it. Yeah. Um... There are no more questions that are coming in, but I think this might be a good way to uh, wrap up this Q&A. Uh, you speak a lot about uh, archives during the pandemic, and I was wondering, in line with the theme of this year's conference, what do you think archives have learned, or what do you hope archives are learning, as most archives are still in the middle of the pandemic? Um, what do you hope archives are learning as they operate during this uh, current pandemic crisis in relation to the climate crisis? Right. It's so fascinating because people, most audiovisual archivists, especially if it's film, it's media, those who are working with physical things, you know, they couldn't go to the office, you know, to work with them. And so there is this, there, there was a shift in thinking about, well, we can't go, we can't touch the materials to actually work with them. What can we then do outside? And so what I found actually during the pandemic period was people telling me, well, we're doing a lot of cataloging. We're catching up in all the backlog because cataloging is usually what's left off to the end. So they're focusing on that. They're thinking about strategies and policies for digital preservation. What will we do for digital preservation? So they took this time to actually really reflect on the work while they couldn't touch the physical materials, which I find actually, I think that's going to be carried forward that lesson, you know, and, and the work that was done during that time will be brought forward. Um, and then just different ways of thinking that, I mean, ironically, which I was saying at the beginning is where we, we had to use these digital technologies, not just to connect, but also then to do work. 
And so people then had to do work and now they're learning that they can do work remotely. But then on the other hand, that will be still impacting the environment. So we just have to be very thoughtful and, you know, and apply everything we have learned from this time. And also that's why it's also bringing in personal choices for the environment, not just the archives, but if we keep pushing and telling, you know, investors, we stop using fossil fuels, we don't want to do that, then there will be more effort towards renewable energies. If every single data center in the world was running on renewable energy, we would have less of an electricity or power resource crunch. On the other hand, that still doesn't, you know, obviate that what we're doing to destroy the planet by taking all of these precious resources out of the planet to make these electronic devices. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there are the two more questions and I think we can squeeze them in and they're kind of related with each other. Uh, so Stu Pearl Harris mentions um, that many of us, I assume these are archivists, do not make decisions regarding some of these storage matters, but they are left to IT staff who often are not only unfamiliar with AV storage preservation matters, but are often not looking at the environment, but simply looking at price. Any advice on how to discuss these matters to IT staff in one's institution? Um, I think we can tie this in with the last question uh, from Julie Mielaga from Probe, Ar from Probe Archives, who says, for companies who are still on the infancy of their AV archiving, will there be a regular capacity building? Oh, this is different. This is specifically for Sapava. So this is just a challenge for Sapava, which I think I will just read at the end of, of your response, Linda. Okay, okay. So um, so back to about how do you talk to your IT staff about to do, well, total cost of ownership, money, money talks. Tell them, hey, why are we putting all of this data on servers, on hard drives, which costs the most money to operate? Why are you doing, why are you backing up to yet another server? You know, think about diversifying the, the whole HSM. Tell them HSM, they'll be impressed. They're IT guys, you know, they'll, they'll think, great, you speak our language. You know, to diversify and use these different tiers, you know, of storage. That, that's what I would recommend. Thank you very much. And I guess I, I will end by uh, Julie's concern, which is also a challenge to Sepava as a whole. Um, regarding a call for capacity building. So if this conference did not happen, um, I guess I'll be blinded, especially with the climate impact. I believe there can be a way that Sipava's guidance can be sustainable as well. Uh, but thank you really for this conference. And, and again, thank you, Linda, for opening our uh, silver anniversary and for this much needed uh, reflection and call to action. Um, as we move forward to the next 20 years. Um, so thank you again, Linda, and I will give it to the organizers. Thank you.